in my day, we used weasel grease in our beard, and we were glad to have it. Yep. Yeah. So, so can I ask Joe, like, what got you started on the movie thing that you're doing now? Like, what you got you started doing that? Um, what did? Oh, I'll, okay. Yeah, I it's. I've always been kind of a music movie fan, but not a movie buff. And then I was, um, I was given senior um, struggling learners one year and, uh, and I had to teach uh, the princess bride and I, and I hate that movie and I hate that book. Love, and, I, true love. <laughs> and so the whole thematic thing through English 12 senior English is heroes. So I was thinking, I don't want to teach this. What if I got rid of this and taught a unit of film on anti-heroes? Cause they're still heroes. They're just different. And so that started me with teaching film. And then as I started to do that, then it bled into the class I usually teach, which is 10th grade high achieving kids. And I started teach, I had to teach myself cause I took a film course in college when I still had the big ass textbook, but I had to teach myself how to teach film because what came down to Adam is we are raising a generation that, doesn't read everything they consume yes. is visual so if i could teach them how to break down the visual if i could teach them from being a passive receptor for entertainment into an active critical thinker like they would have to in a novel and the skills are pretty translatable what's kind of because a movie is a story it has right. symbolism <laughs> it has plot it has characterization it's just a book on film but it also has all the film aspects and how to look at, you know, what makes Adam Sandler just crack um, a film versus whatever wins nine Academy Awards. Well, what is that? Well, there are a lot of things. And if I could teach them how to read that, I would give them a skill that goes even far beyond movies. Like they could do that with like uh, campaign ads during a political election, you know, just all anything that they discern visually could have some influence on them. And I want them to be able to, 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 to look at editing and sound and camera angle and camera movement. And so that's what it was. That's super awesome, man. To fact that the fact that you thought enough to say, okay, if our kids are not reading, how can I translate modern stuff and still get the same, um, skill set yeah across we need more people like you buddy <laughs> we do I, I, and i mean that that's super cool because i think um and i can't speak to it as much as you know you guys being teachers and stuff but i think that we are and this is an opinion but i think we're doing a disservice to our kids sometimes with the amount of technology that we have yeah um, I mean, obviously there's some things that help, man, but there's some things that there's skill sets that we've lost that you just spoke about as a yeah. matter of fact, you know, yeah. and, and I think it's important. A lot, a lot of times these kids nowadays can't even think for themselves. And I think by you doing something that can broaden and, and really you make them use their brains in a way like that, that's super cool, man. So good job there for sure. Um, thank you. Ironically, I no longer get to teach film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they took it away. And yeah. they took it away because uh, there are a lot of reasons. It's why I'm so unenamored with my job right now. It's why I wish I could retire tomorrow because um, the key, Adam, is engagement. Mm -hmm. All right. You engage them, you can make them move mountains. The novels, as great a book as Lord of the Flies is, it's not engaging a struggling learner. They're not going to read it. Correct. All right. So, what if I could do something else with a different vehicle? And I, I don't want to sound like I'm like um, Einstein here, but the reticence I meet, the walls I had to go against from upper admin who just aren't willing to say, because I got them. I got when they are so engaged and they're so thirsty for it. I designed a whole elective course for seniors, um, or not elective. It was partial literature and partial film, and a whole big thing went down about a year and three months ago. That if I did not need my job, I would have quit because it was. Um, it was very disheartening on a lot of levels to me. Um, and I love my students, but um, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely completely disillusioned with education in my district right now. Well, see, coming from somebody, and this is going to get real boring for the show, so I apologize for if this doesn't get cut out and you're still watching this. But, We're just talking. Right. But co coming from somebody who was a struggling learner myself in school, um, you know, um, 
reading comprehension I sucked with. I'd ha- I, to this day, I have to read a page three times in order to go back and figure out what the hell I just read. Yeah. You know, um, so to have somebody that can see that, take that and portray it in a way that maybe could allow me to pick up on it and understand it better. That would have been awesome, man. Yeah, it, it, it takes, I don't know. I, I, I think of this one kid. He was a troubled kid. He wasn't passing the kind of things he needed to pass. He was in a remedial class that I was in and I'm a big rap guy and I needed to teach him metaphor and, and symbolism. And I knew he listened to rap. So I, I played a rap song for him. I gave him the lyric sheet and we broke down the story because it's a story song. It's called Jesus the Pimp and a 79 Granada last night by a great revolutionary band out of California called The Coup. And it, it, it's this really cool story, but it has a lot of symbol and metaphor as well as other things. And he was on top of it. And it's a matter of recognizing what can my students identify with so that they open the door for me to actually teach them. Yeah, Not and teach them by throwing the shit at yes. them. That the, the curriculum. Sometimes you got to be able to move. You got to have latitude, and administrations aren't always. And I, and Brian and I completely different. Brian has a set of skills he has to teach for whatever math he's teaching. Now he can vary that for lesson, but the skills remain the same no matter what, right? He's got to take kids from A to Z in trig or A to Z in calculus, whatever it is. Pretty cut and so dry. If for his differentiation is, well, what if I did a different kind of activity to get that skill across? Me, with English, we're not linear like that. We're kind of all over because we touch so many skills. I think we need to have a little bit more latitude in certain instances. But, you know, our, our, our education system sucks, Adam. It wants to one size fit all while telling you you need to individualize and know your student, but not giving the teachers the freedom to do that in, in yeah. many and see, I just had that conversation with Dominic on the phone. He called me from work on his break, and we were talking how about IU basketball and how pathetic Indiana is. And uh, <clears throat> and I used that because I used to run the gym, right, and have to be a general manager. And I used that as an example because we he was frustrated. He's like, I don't understand, you know. And I'm like, listen, you could have C level talent, but if you have a coach that knows how to take each individual player and his specific way to get through to him, to get him to accomplish something, you can take that C level and make it be. And it kind of is the same way you're talking. If you're a teacher and you have, unlike Brian, the, the ability to come off that main line and look at what your student is, how that student will probably perceive something better if it's presented in a different way. I mean, like I respect you guys for that because I think, that is a, a must have today. So to hear that you were able to do that and go against the grain of what they wanted you to do, dude, that's awesome, man. So I'm a rebel, man. I'm right a rebel. on. <laughs> I, I, I butted heads all the way up to the superintendent on stuff and, and I lost, but I was going to fight it. But you I had to bet my seniors last year, the last semester when all the shit came down, we had the best damn time. I've had three of them email me already talking about how great that class was mm-hmm. and, and, and that and that's all you ever want as a teacher that's all you ever want is that experience and that learning to to go boom to have that kind of impact you know and uh so that class is that class and there never will be another like it and i've accepted that but i but i sit th- i can't help but think i've got eight more years in this gig all of my senior classes could have been that class for eight more years mm-hmm. you know yeah <laughs> Well, do we have any more topics because i can't think of anything now i'm my, we yeah, didn't totally touch movies, my train didn't touch movies? We haven't talked about movies. We, well, I mean, we talked a little bit about Joe I'm, Stilton, I'm right? curious to hear what you got. What movie, if you can remember a single movie that really kind of either impacted you or changed how you looked at the world or, or whatever? Mm. Uh, I can go because mine won't take very long because I had a very sheltered childhood and I really didn't go watch movies uh, until maybe I started driving and dating and that kind of stuff. So I, that's, I didn't watch a lot of movies till high school. My, uh, when I was in college, um, everybody made fun of me because I hadn't seen Star Wars or Indiana Jones or any of that stuff. So they made me sit down and watch all the Star Wars movies and all the Indiana Jones movies. Uh, I love watching movies. I don't know if they've really ever really affected me that much i mean there's two powerful ones and they were just you know that really intense with saving private ryan and mm-hmm. the passion of the christ and those were just 
I mean, it's tough to watch at certain times. And that, that, I mean, that's something that you don't ever forget when it's some of those kind of scenes. But uh, other than that, I don't have any that's affected me in a, any sort of way. Uh, I know Joe's a big film guy. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't go to film any, uh, go to movies much anymore these days, ever since I've, you know, decided to have five kids. It's rare for my wife and I to get out and do that, but I still watch a lot thanks to pay services. But the one movie I remember seeing in the theaters that had me openly weeping was um, Schindler's List. Me too. That's a good one. I didn't watch that one in theater. But yeah, I did that's, too, that's, Joe. That one, that one moved you. And there was one scene where, where he looks at his Nazi pin and, and it's like, this pin, it's worth so many lives. And I was just like, oh, you know, I just lost it. So Schindler's List, seeing it live in the theater, I was with a good buddy who was big in a film. Um, uh, that that definitely was the most emotional experience I've had in a theater. Over. Yeah, or when they have to hide in the outhouse. Yeah. You know, like things like that, man. That's tough to watch, dude. It is. That I remember seeing that at the theater with my mom. And, and uh, yeah, I had to say, that was, that was the difficult one. I was like, why did you bring me to this, mom? What the <laughs> hell? <laughs> what, 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 what are you thinking? You know what I mean? You know, my dad always, my dad never wanted us to watch anything we wanted to watch. So unless I got up early before school and caught a little bit of cartoons, it was always, we're watching what I want to watch. You know, my dad was the kind, I'm going to get home from work, Adam, pull my boots off my feet. Where's the recliner at? You know, and then, and then I'm not watching that crap turn it on this so we'd be watching i'd be watching horror movies you know and uh all these kind of things um but as far as uh, music impacts me more than the movies mo yeah, mo mo you, you know i'm sure it's with a lot of people i haven't ever really seen a movie that's that's changed my life or made me like whoa you know um but impactful scenes or impactful movies that hit you hard while you're watching them or something or make you think um you know i would have to agree with joe probably that's the one that stood out to me the most um but yeah what about you buddy of oh, me. All right. So context. Born in the South, relocated to the Midwest whenever I was six or seven. And right around that time, the outlaw Josie Wales came out. Having removing all of the the slavery and all that stuff as far as what led up to the Civil War, the Outlaw Josie Wales is about after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I, that really resonated with me because he was a rebel and he's dealing with all these Yankees, which is kind of how I felt. So here I am, even though the, even though Missouri was a swing state, so to speak, um, I, that one really identified and kind of started me on that rebel mentality because that's what led to me not being rebellious in the antisocial burning down things, <laughs> but looking outside of everybody is telling you, you do this. Why? That kind of started that for me. Right. Um, I can, I mean, there, there were, you know, there are those movies that really impact us. Um, you know, we could say, well, Star Wars turned me into a sci-fi nerd. Well, Tell the truth, if Star Wars had never existed, I was going to be a nerd anyway. I mean, that was just, that was going to happen. Um, and, you know, during during our teen years, we watched these movies that kind of influence as far as what we think about society and kind of, they either reinforce patterns or get you to realize that there are other patterns out there. But I would, I would definitely say music has impacted me more but in the interest of giving a broader spectrum, you know, what does influence us, which is, again, that's a lot of what I do with my work. And you bring up a good point about, uh, you know, from our generation. And like I said, I was very sheltered is, you know, most of the time back back then, you just believed everything your parents told you because you didn't know any better until you were able to go off on your own. And for me, I was the first to my family to go to college and you start being challenged when you see, uh, you know, certain things being presented in college classes and that kind of stuff. So, you know, everybody has that kind of enlightening awakening process at some point to say, Oh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, believe in this certain religion or this is the way to do it or politics or whatever the case may be. It's, 
I think that back in the day, that transition was a lot older than it is now with the kids having more access to, to, to information than what we had. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I also think that different generations have a very different idea of what a, um, a time period was like, you know, based on what they see on television. Mm. If you watch, you know, shows from the 50s, Leave it to Beaver, just pulling one out of the air. Um, Leave it to Beaver made everything look very Pollyanna and hey, society didn't really have any problems. Everything was wonderful. Everybody loved Ike. And uh, in reality, there was a lot of alcoholism going on. And there were a lot of underlying social issues that didn't make it into mainstream media for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I will never forget, I was working on my, own, uh, my bachelor's and I was a non-traditional student. I took 10 years of life to figure out how to be less stupid and to be more socially adaptive. And so here I am pushing 30 in a classroom, in a history class, and the professor had just informed everybody that he was actively involved in the civil rights movement. And so this kid pops up and um, in that early, well, this would have been late nineties, kind of trying to emulate how hippie thought hippies dressed. He, he asked his professors, so the 60s, that was a wild time, right? Wow. Man's just told you he was involved in the civil rights movement. And in your mind, you automatically go to everything from 1961 to uh, December 31st, 1968, or 69 rather, was just free love and everybody smoking weed and dropping acid and all that kind of stuff. When reality was much different. Most of the country was um, much more identifying with the Merle Haggard, uh, I'm an Okie from Muskogee, and uh, you know we don't we don't smoke marijuana kind of mentality. Much more pervasive. So to me, that's always that's one of those things I think about too. Not in my spare time when I'm, you know, not doctoring a dog with bleeding ears. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as a good case of hemorrhoids.